So hello everyone and welcome to this event, uh, Chat Protection in an Age of End-to-End -end Encryption, hosted by yours truly, Prothesia Foundation. Um, so it is wonderful to have everyone here today on this beautiful pre-Thanksgiving Friday. And thank you again for taking the time to come to this today. It was originally scheduled in October, but due to some kind of sudden and um, unexpected challenges with scheduling that arose with our um, original panelists, we had to reschedule. Um, and we're just thankful that we're able to get this going now um, before the holiday season really kicks into gear. So yes, my name is Dr. Gillian Tenbergen and I'll be the facilitator and um, MC for this event, if you will, um, representing both Prostasia Foundation and helping to moderate with uh, or in the discussion section later when we uh, open it up to all the panelists and to the to you as the attendees uh, to ask questions and really get all the information that you would like to know um, about the topic of encryption and child protection. Um, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay. I'm assuming Jeremy and, and Aaron could hear me before, so I'm assuming that means everybody can. Um, all right, so just a couple of, of house rules before we get started. Um, for participants, just if you can, make sure you're muted um, during the, the presentations from both of our panelists, uh, just to make sure, and I'll keep myself muted because I have my child at home with me today, so no one wants to be serenaded by that. Um, so yeah, just keep yourself muted while we're while we're doing that and then you can unmute as soon as we move into the discussion section if you have any questions um, questions can be either typed into the chat and i can um, ask them or you can unmute yourself and ask them uh, personally um we will have about 20 to 25 minutes maybe of um panel discussion or panel presentation with our panelists jeremy malcolm and aaron weiss and then we'll move into the open um, open session when you can ask all the questions that may be burning um, in the back of your mind about child, and, child protection and encryption. Um, so yes, Prostasia Foundation is hosting this event. And just as a, a reminder, Prostasia Foundation is your local nonprofit organization dedicated to child protection uh, through ensuring um, that evidence-based means are used and that we are upholding all human rights in the process of protecting children from sexual harm and sexual violence. So yes, enough about me and enough about um, kind of the details. Now we can move it directly into the first panel session with Jeremy and I will let uh, Jeremy introduce himself since he knows more about what he's doing than I could ever hope to know. So. Thank you, and I'll put myself on mute. If anyone has any questions for me, you can feel free to send them to me in the chat. Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, I'm going to try and uh, see if I can <laughs> um, expand my window here. OK, are the slides moving? Yes? OK, great. Well. Uh, thank you, Gillian, again. Um, today, I'll be talking about why trading privacy for child safety is never justified. Um, as you've heard during my introduction, um, I'm a trust and safety professional uh, who works, well, actually, you haven't, so I'm introducing myself right now. <laughs> I'm a trust and safety professional who works with internet companies to battle online child sexual abuse, and I advocate for approaches that focus on preventing abuse in the first place while preserving children's privacy. Um, this morning, I'll be talking at record speed about uh, where lawmakers are proposing to trade off privacy for child safety, uh, when those laws might pass, who's behind them, uh, why they won't work and will actually harm children, what platforms in my industry are doing instead, and how we as a society could do more. Um, so to kick it off, uh, we're rapidly heading towards a world in which everything that you communicate or store online 
will be scanned by agents of law enforcement to predict whether it might involve a crime. Stop me if this sounds like a science fiction movie that you've seen before. Um, and uh, this includes uh, bypassing uh, the encryption that um, protects the security of our communications. Um, this it, here, hopefully you can see two billboards here. Is my screen actually working as it should? Good. Um, so we see a battle of two billboards here. On the one hand, on the left, um, we have the Apple advertisement saying what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. Um, and uh, this is obviously because we want our own phones um, to be kept private. We want our, our photos and our chats um, to, to be kept private if uh, unless we choose to share them. But on the other hand, this means acknowledging the likelihood that some people will misuse that, that privacy um, to send or receive CSAM. And for many people, that's unacceptable. Um, so for those people who say, we can't allow that, their solution is to force internet providers um, to put their users under warrantless, suspicionless surveillance. Um, and those blanket surveillance laws are starting to get passed around the world um, as we speak. Um, the, the UK and Australia have already passed laws that allow regulators to direct platforms to perform such surveillance. And in Europe, um, such a law is under negotiation now, um, where uh, the European Commission is promoting a law that would uh, require platforms to bypass encryption um, in order to pass all of the communications through an AI filter and, um, and, and potentially uh, expose that content to, to law enforcement. Um, so I have a blog post about what happened this week in the European negotiations, which I'm not going to go into now, but I'll link you to my blog at the end where you can uh, read more about what's going on in Europe. Um, so who's driving these laws? Well, unfortunately, um, it's most of the child safety groups that you've heard of. Um, ECPAT internationally, NICMEC in the United States, the NSPCC in the UK, also surveillance tech companies like Thorn and police forces from around the world. So you'd be forgiven for thinking that, well, maybe this is okay. Maybe, you know, bypassing encryption and cracking into secure communications um, is justified in the cause of child protection. But I'd like to suggest that it's actually, it, it really is a problem and police don't always get the balance right. The example that I've uh, given before is, um, like the the kind of shameful case where um, the police ran a, a dark web CSAM site for 11 months to try and catch a few of the perpetrators. And in the course of that, of course, they, they shared thousands of abuse images and even uploaded new abuse images themselves. So it's kind of shameful to say that some of the highest profile individuals and groups in the child protect, protection sector condoned this operation, um, which I feel like uh, is obviously not okay. And, and human rights groups such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were among those that condemned this operation. So I feel we can't just assume that um, it's okay to bypass human rights for the sake of um, ar arresting perpetrators. Um, and more, more specifically, we have to ensure that we don't harm the people that we're trying to help with laws like this. Um, and um, over, over three quarters of CSAM that we know about, and a lot more that we don't know about, um, is self-produced material. And police don't need to become involved every time a teenager uh, takes a lewd photo. Um, exposing that sort of private content to authorities preemptively cannot be justified. And this is the kind of thing, this slide shows the kind of thing that can happen. Um, an underage pregnant teenage girl was criminalized under an unjust law because her messages were intercepted by authorities. Um, and this is gonna happen more and more. Th that wouldn't have been possible um, if the messages had been encrypted. And, and Facebook in fact is going to be um, introducing encryption um, to Messenger, which has generated a lot of controversy and in part is why um, 
authorities are now moving to restrict the availability of encryption because they they want to be able to snip on your messages and um, and the result will be tragic cases like this. But as a trust and safety professional, I'm not going to be a party to that. I um, There are other ways that we can um, protect children online um, without blanket surveillance. Um, so I, uh, in my work, I, I uh, recommend that our users' communications should be encrypted where possible. And I also advise my clients to design their products um, in such a way that they, they are more safe so that teenagers aren't placed into situations where they risk being taken advantage of. Um, for example, one thing that we can do is illustrated here. This is what Apple does. Um, it enables parents to turn on a feature um, that can detect when a child is sending or receiving a nude image and it will show them a warning um, give them information, encourage them to maybe think twice and to talk to their caregiver. And all of this can be done without infringing the child's privacy. The photo doesn't go to police, it doesn't go to parents, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, it's, it stays uh, um, private as it should be. And that's just one example of, of things that internet platforms can do. The blog post that I mentioned um, that I'll be linking to at the end also gives more information about what the trust and safety profession is doing to keep kids safe without uh, requiring us to bypass encryption. Um, with that said, there is a lot more that we can do uh, and internet platforms don't hold all the keys. Um, you know, they, they simply, uh, don't have the capacity to prevent child sexual abuse alone. There's a lot more that we need to do as a society. We need to be more honest about how we talk about the problem. Um, we need to provide stigma-free support to potential offenders. We need to fund research and social services. Um, there's there's many many things that we can do, and putting all of our um, put of all all of the, putting all of the responsibility on internet platforms is not the answer. So uh, let's review. Um, we are sliding into a surveillance state across the world uh, due to a push by law enforcement contractors and some advocacy groups that are framed in terms of protecting children, but will actually harm children by exposing more of their private content to adult eyes. Meanwhile, internet platforms already have some better solutions that um, don't involve infringing privacy and there's a lot more that we can do as a society to prevent abuse and to reduce harm. So uh, I'm going to take questions. Uh, um, I'm not sure if that's going to be now or later, Gillian. Maybe you can you can let us know. But but meanwhile, um, the blog uh, post that I mentioned, if you go to the URL at the bottom there, that's my blog, um, which goes into more detail about some of what I've been discussing. Um, you can also follow me on social media and um, and also my email address is there if you want to follow up uh, with questions by email later if you're watching this recording um, afterwards. So um, that's about it. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That was incredibly informative and helped give me um, quite the oversight as to kind of what's going on and kind of connect the dots with um, with especially many of the bills that have been passed or that have been proposed lately um, regarding encryption and what we should be doing with it. So yes, um, does anybody have any questions at this time for Jeremy? If you do, we're happy to take them. If not, we can wait until the end uh, and take them then. Okay, so... In that case, uh, we'll move into um, Aaron Weiss's uh, discussion or presentation, and I'm I'm totally stoked about getting to listen to both of these excellent speakers. They are so informed and so knowledgeable on these on these topics. So, yes, thank you, Aaron. Now the stage is yours. All righty, thanks so much, and um, I definitely encourage everyone to read Jeremy's blog. Um, I became where I'm at at this moment uh, by reaching out to Jeremy probably a year ago after being interested in some of the content in his blog, um, because a lot of this, this topic has been bubbling up uh, in my mind for the, the last couple of years. 
Um, and so I'm really happy to be able to share my perspective uh, with all of you and you can disseminate the information, uh, rewatch this at a later time as well. Uh, so my, na my name is Aaron. Uh, I'm a digital forensics analyst. I own a company. Uh, I'm also an expert witness. And I work on a lot of uh, criminal defense cases uh, involving CSAM, which is uh, child sexual abuse material, um, traveling to meet a minor cases, uh, sextortion, a lot of different cases. I'm going to talk a little bit about that experience. Um, I'm also a, a court appointed volunteer child advocate in our state's dependency system. So a court may appoint me to advocate for children who have been abused, neglected, and abandoned uh, while they're in the foster care system until there's, there's permanency. Um, so that's another kind of view that I get. And I'm also a parent of uh, two high school students. So uh, I've been raising kids in this digital world uh, really from the beginning of in the early 2000s. Um, the kind of three topics, uh, which I'm mostly exclusive from what Jeremy talked about purposely, um, there's just so much to, to really get into. Uh, I, you know, I have kind of three different perspectives that I want to present to you and hopefully get you thinking about what you can do as parents, as community members, as voters, uh, to, you know, to, to have your voice uh, and to help protect children, uh, but without having to break encryption, right? Um, th this is just my perspective. Um, I think I have a unique uh, perspective because there's not a lot of people that, that have these kind of three different viewpoints. And I think it's important to, uh, to share from all different viewpoints. So I mentioned I'm a digital forensics examiner. Um, for over 10 years, I've been working on cases involving CSAM. So this is uh, defendants, perpetrators who are, are trading this material, uh, who are manufacturing the material, who are more recently running the sextortion scams, uh, which is, I don't, I'm not gonna call it an epidemic, but uh, many of you have maybe heard anecdotes from others in your community about uh, a teen who uh, sent a an illicit image to a scammer and now they're being blackmailed. Um, kids are harming themselves over this and, and it's a real problem. And as part of my job, which is to uh, look at the digital evidence in cases and advise attorneys what, uh, what the digital evidence says, um, I'm forced to conduct a lot of the examinations at various sheriff's offices, at the Office of FBI, Homeland Security. And what, what that does give me is, yes, I get to see how the government is prosecuting um, offenders, but I also frequently speak with law enforcement uh, in small sheriff's offices at the federal level. And I get to see sometimes in real time what they're dealing with because I'm often in their office um, while I'm conducting the examinations. And you know, I get to see what their struggles are and hear from them of what kind of cases that uh, are really trending. As a child advocate, uh, I'm dealing with foster kids. And the, the main takeaway that I see in this system that's really troubling is that there's often abuse that's happening and there's no technology involved. There's children that are being sexually abused by their own family, their siblings, uh, neighbors, friends, uh, schools, et cetera. And, you know, the encryption is not going to answer this problem. I feel like sometimes the focus on this encryption, um, AI, et cetera, that's happening um, is great for politicians to talk about, but when it gets down to it, it's not going to help a lot of the kids that are right in our own backyard. And as a parent, I have to have these conversations with my children. Uh, age appropriate, I've had to find out my own resources and figure out the right words to, to use to speak to children. Um, but I personally feel like giving them the knowledge about what's out there um, in advance is, is going to help them when they have to make a decision as to whether to click, uh, whether to communicate, whether to share. Um, you know, 
speaking of history, th this also makes me think of um, my other role investigating data breaches. And data breaches are when there's a company or an individual that that is compromised. Uh, they have credit cards stolen, uh, company email is hacked, um, your iPhone is you know, compromised, your iCloud is compromised. And know before, which is a, a security awareness training company, prob probably the leading one, um, a lot of their research from other institutions shows that, you know, I'm, the numbers don't really matter, but essentially social engineering is the primary cause of all these breaches. And I think that that idea that technology can't solve all the issues and that we have to really implement the human firewall, which is the parents and the children, to to be the best way to to secure us through uh, information. So that's kind of a similar field um, that really we've seen. You know, social engineering, human firewall is really important. Uh, I've also this might seem like a leap, but the war on drugs was kind of another thing that I grew up with. Right, that that's almost parallel to what we're seeing, where there was a, a reaction about um, the issues related to drugs. And from my experience, you know, I had parents who weren't drug users, who weren't drinkers, uh, but my mom was a nurse, so she read a lot, she sought information so she can inform us. Um, she was realistic about the conversations that she had, and really what what she did was she told us, you know, don't drink and drive. You can always call us to pick you up. Um, some drugs are addictive and can kill you. And three, when it comes time, you want to try something, you know, make, make sure you're being safe. And I think having this information versus what, you know, that we were really seeing in public, uh, you know, which was the egg in the frying pan and a guy in a big trench coat uh, was just not information that was helpful to me. It didn't help inform me to be the human firewall. Uh, it just left me going, okay, so guy in a trench coat, fried eggs. Uh, I, I haven't had that conversation. And the just say no thing just was uh, not appropriate for every si situation. So parents and kids, right? The kids are on the front line. Uh, kids get embarrassed. They're teased. They're bullied. They have vanity um and they also make mistakes so we you know we have to know this is going to happen um surveillance on the kids is just i don't believe is the answer i believe empowerment is um i love what the fbi is doing right now uh i don't always defend everything law enforcement does but i've seen the fbi really pushing this is from uh last month you know, they're they're trying to put out this information about the, the trends that are happening, sextortion, which is, uh, to me, a huge problem. And kids are killing themselves and hurting themselves over this. They don't have an outlet. Um, and these things are happening urgently, quickly, and um, we have to be informed. The FBI and, and our uh, neighboring county has also been partnering with public schools. I think this is great to inform parents and children exactly what we're doing here is trying to get the word out so that we can appropriately monitor our own children, use the tools that technology offers, um, and know what kind of scams and sextortion offenders are out there. Be aware of the types of apps that they're using to start conversations so we can, can apply our own monitoring uh, in our homes. So, you know, this is kind of an example of what I've mostly told my kids um, pretty much from when they were very young until as they're growing into their later teenage years, uh, you know, don't meet anyone in person. Your location's private to everyone online. So if you're on Discord, you know, you want to make up some information, that's fine. Don't tell people where you live. Don't tell people where you go to school. Be conscious about what's in the background when you're when you're on video, et cetera. And you can come to us no matter how deep down the rabbit hole you've gone and we have your back, right? Kids don't want their phones taken away. They know, if they know their phone's getting taken away, they're not gonna tell anybody. Uh, and I'm not 
giving specific parental advice, but I'm saying we have to think about these things and be realistic. Lastly, I find the problem of resource allocation to be a major issue. Um, I'm not going to say the, the encryption, you know, monitoring is this or that is a red herring, but I do think that as we are spending our time and focus and and political power and resources on trying I'm to- I'm gonna drop you off at, I don't know, but when we pick Dan up now, can this guy hear me? What's that? Oh, all right. Um, yeah, so the, the resource allocation I think is, is an issue. Um, I think that when if when we just divert all focus into one one area, I think oops, someone's speaking. If they can mute, um, you know, again, the family and friends abuse. I think that this takes away from that um, law enforcement's ability to conduct undercover chatting and operations where they are catching predators trying to meet minors. I think that. I'm seeing in sheriff's offices around around the state, at least, that they're not able to spend the time doing that because there's such a flood of cyber tips coming in from NECMEC, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. And as Jeremy, Jeremy alluded to, a lot of this can end up being um, self-made by teens. There's false positives. It's a lot of resources. Uh, I think that when I read about a search warrant in some cases, for a case involving uh, CSAM. I think about the hundreds of hours that are spent on carrying out the search warrant. Um, I think about how many analyst hours, uh, attorney hours, et cetera. And I wonder if taking all of those hours, those officer hours, um, spending a half hour at middle schools and high schools around the area and educating kids on the types of scams that are happening to their other to students in that actual area, uh, if that would not be a better way to use resources to protect uh, the children in in our communities. Um, and lastly, kids are smart. They're smart. They don't need to be on your parents' cell phone plan anymore. Kids can go out and get a burner phone, hop on any Wi-Fi, and create accounts. Uh, fake accounts and communicate with who they want to. So I, again, I think this is a, a cat and mouse game that that is a losing battle. Um, aside from all the privacy issues that uh, are, I think are out of my scope for for this talk. And that's what I got for ten, ten minutes. I was waiting for my child to stop screaming before I unmuted myself. Um, so my apologies. But thank you, Erin, for that incredibly informative um introduction there. Um I'm always I'm always so fascinated to listen to your talk, listen to your experiences um with this topic, both as a as a, a digital forensics. A forensic digital analyst is that how you put it um uh, digital forensic examiner is probably the easiest way to say it. okay <laughs> i will probably mess that up um but as as a person who knows all things digital and forensic um just listening to your perspective on that really uh drives home i think some of the points that many of us and i know people like me uh have about this so uh, thank you both, Jeremy and Aaron, for offering your unique and incredibly informed perspectives um, on this topic. So we can move into the open discussion now. So this includes everybody. Um, if you have questions or comments um, that you would like to add to this, uh, you are absolutely welcome to do so. Um, oh, hey, there's another human. Look at that. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'll come uh, on camera. <laughs> Hi, Christine. Um, it's nice yeah, to meet you. Hi. Yeah, hi. nice to meet you. So, so um, I'm coming absolutely. at this. So I work for Proton, um, Proton Mail, other encrypted services. So coming at this from the company perspective, uh, not rather than the parent perspective, but 
interested in both um of course but um yeah so I guess I'm like I'm curious so I so like um Jeremy like what you're what you talked about like we are tracking all this legislation and trying to give a first you know our perspective on why encryption is important for everyone and why it's not in conflict with um child safety and I am kind of curious both your perspectives on um but yeah so I do policy more than like the actual anti-abuse work um but like what your kind of experience is um with talking to like law enforcement and their investigations because I feel like they're among lawmakers there seems to be this misunderstanding that there is like a dearth of evidence of these crimes and if only we could break encryption and have access to everyone's communications then we would have all that we needed to prosecute to the fullest extent and I just um don't think that's actually the case of from the law enforcement perspective and investigation perspective. So yeah, kind of curious your thoughts on that. Cause I think um, there are a lot of misunderstandings on Capitol Hill and in other countries. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. I think there are a few problems there. Uh, one of them is that the, the, the issue is discussed in silos. We have really law enforcement people who go to conferences like uh, Crimes Against Children. We have, um, the more of the um psychologists and criminologists and, and um social workers and so on who go to conferences like ATSA which uh, Gillian uh, is involved with um and and often these two groups uh are talking about the problem in different ways um they're talking about um obviously you know from law enforcement child protection is a law enforcement issue and, and how could it be considered anything else? Whereas from the other side, um, it's a public health issue and it's much better to um, look at this problem through that lens. Um, now, obviously in reality, there are both dimensions to the problem. There is a law enforcement criminal justice dimension to the problem, but there is also a broader public health dimension to the problem. Um, and, uh, and you're never going to really find solutions if you're if you're looking at it through only uh, one set of you know tinted glasses um so that's one issue um that i think needs to be addressed there needs to be more silo breaking and um i mean prostasia foundation was really formed to try to be a, a silo breaking um organization that would um bring people who would never be considered uh able to speak on child protection like for example um, sex workers um, are another uh, who there was nobody else was including them in the conversation, even though they have a lot of um, a lot to contribute in the fight against uh, sex trafficking in particular. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, there's other communities like sexual minority communities that are excluded um, um we have sorry I, I say we because I used to be in Gillian's shoes she is now in control of the organization but um there's a um the, the Prostasia is the only child protection organization that has a relationship with the um, National um, Coalition for Sexual Freedom the NCSF um and uh, Woodhull Freedom Foundation, I guess, is in a similar sort of um, uh, boat. They are trying to um, look at sexual freedom, but they don't specifically focus on abuse prevention. So um, I think, yeah, busting these silos, getting people who are normally not included in these conversations included is one way that we can um, produce more informed outcomes. And and I... I uh, it, it I, a few years ago, I would have thought you would never get, for example, sex workers talking on Capitol Hill, but that has happened in the last year. Um, the uh, Free Speech Coalition, which represents the adult content creators, um, has have been talking on Capitol Hill with people. Um, so um, that may seem like a digression from your question, but I think it it just shows we need to um, stop stigmatizing really anyone who wants to contribute to this discussion and to um, talk about what we can do to to solve um, online abuse. Um, the other thing I would say is you're right that there's um, hardly a, a dearth of evidence 
against um, child sex offenders. There's so much um, of a backlog of uh, cases that are not being prosecuted that that's really where the resources for law enforcement should go. We shouldn't be putting resources into getting new surveillance tools. We should be putting resources into going through the backlog of reported cases um, and just dealing with them because at the moment, law enforcement has to throw out um, the majority of reports that they receive um, and just to focus on the worst cases. So the worst cases would tend to be defined as the youngest children um, undergoing the, the worst forms of abuse. Um, anything else, they just don't even look at um, a lot of the time because they're, they're overwhelmed. So, yeah, there's no... If, if we're going to start um, requiring... Uh, encryption to be bypassed and to uh, be searching through private messages for evidence of um, uh, images that have never been, uh, that may not even be of interest to law enforcement, that's just going to make this backlog even worse. Um, and the final thing that I would say is, um, <laughs> I just scribbled a note and now I'm trying to read what it says. Um, no, I can't read my own writing. So I'm not sure what the last thing that I was going to say was going to be, but maybe I've said enough and I should pass on to Aaron at this point. Okay, great. Yeah. Hey, hey, Christine, thanks for being here and asking the questions. Um, there, I think, again, like Jeremy said, law enforcement is completely overwhelmed. Um, I see that as a major problem. Um, they are behind on on prosecutions and they're just flooded with uh, with tips. So, you know, finding people to to charge and arrest, I, I, I don't think that's a problem. Um, I don't see any indication that they're having problems going after and prosecuting and, and putting people in jail. Um, you know, what one thing that I was thinking of that I'm concerned about, the, the more broad this gets, the more eyes on the material that that we do have to uh that, that we're putting on by by this mass surveillance is I, I have a concern for the workers who have to view and categorize this um i think that they do suffer uh and and i'm mindful myself when i'm working on cases uh but especially law enforcement who are working on these cases every single day um those at the platform providers who are receiving tips and, and are having to submit the cyber tips. I worry about them as well. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of these cases, it's not technology that that stops the really bad uh, offenders who are causing children, doing the sextortion, causing them, children to generate uh, CSAM, to abuse their siblings and and others, um, young young kids as well. Uh, I've had a few cases where it's you know ten to twelve children have been subject to this, and the only reason it stops is because one kid goes and tells his parent, and then law enforcement can take action um, and come down. So. I still believe in that human firewall is really. Um, what's necessary. Uh, I mentioned the, the war on drugs, right? We're what 50 years into the war on drugs and we're still catching and, um, you know, putting away consumers, which we need to do that, but it doesn't really solve the problem. I think, you know, after reading a lot of psych reports and seeing trends that I know law enforcement sees the trends as well, that they could speak to and contribute to helping to identify why this is happening, what causes someone to go down the road of viewing and consuming uh, CSAM. Because I believe that most people don't wake up one day and go, you know what? I think today is the day I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit younger and start consuming CSAM. It's that is not the norm. Um, I don't think we're no matter what technology is in place, no matter how much surveillance, we're ever going to get to the bottom of it if we're not trying to really figure out the root cause. Can I ask you guys a quick 
follow-up question. <laughs> um, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I'm wondering like kind of as we're, because I feel like we're in the position now of like saying um, this child safety bill is bad. This one's bad. <laughs> They're all bad. And I want to be able to support something that is positive. And like, do you have um, policies you support that you think like get to more root cause issues? Is it funding for these law enforcement um, units that work on this or um, kind of what's your like positive proposal that you advocate for? Uh, I'll take that first. So um, there's a couple of laws out there that have just been um, ignored in favor of the, the, the law enforcement bills. One of them is the Jenna Quinn law. So Jenna Quinn is a child sex abuse survivor um, and a motivational speaker and uh, many other things. Uh, wonderful lady uh, from Texas. And um, the law that bears her name um, funds and uh, uh, sets up an infrastructure for um, education about prevention um, in schools, not just for children, though, also for teachers and parents. Um, it's a wonderful law, and it does already exist uh, on a state level in uh, several states um, throughout the US, but there's a national version of it that um, she's been trying to pass for, I think, three sessions of Congress now. And each time it's it's gone so far and then, and then it hasn't gone any further. So um, take a look at the Jenna Quinn law. Uh, we would love to see that passed. Um, there's another one that um, when the Earn It Act, I'm sure you've heard of the Earn It Act, when that law first came up um, and it had a lot of problems with it, um, there was an alternative uh, that was put up against it called the Invest in Child Safety Act by um, Ron Wyden. And um, unfortunately, the Invest in Child Safety Act, unlike the Jenna Quinn law, uh, isn't up for consideration in the current Congress. So uh, it's not currently possible to support that law. But that would have been a much better alternative to the Earn it Act, which would have done uh, uh, some of the things that we've said are actually necessary, like uh, funding the um, enforcement of existing laws and the prosecution of existing cases. Um, uh, the Earn it Act doesn't give any new funding at all, whereas the Invest in Child Safety Act would have given five, I think it was $5 billion um, over a number of years towards not only enforcement, but also prevention. Um, and it's really unusual to find laws that fund uh, prevention of child sexu sexual abuse. Um, one of the, actually, I don't remember speaking to one of the slides that I had. Um, let me see if I can, oh, no, never mind. Uh, I, I had a quote in one of my slides um, from uh, Elizabeth Letourneau, who pointed out that we have, uh, Elizabeth Letourneau is from the Johns uh, Hopkins Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse. And um, she had a, um, a quote that I gave, let me just see if I can find it, um, uh, where we spend only $1 for prevention for every, I think it's $325 for enforcement. And so that's obviously wildly unbalanced. Um, so one thing that there's not necessarily a law that will do this, but we need to um, fund more prevention research. Um, we need to um, de-stigmatize the provision of mental health and other support services to people who are at risk of offending. Um, we need to just talk about the problem in a more honest way. Um, that doesn't incentivize the wrong solutions. I mean, one of the reasons why we always have law enforcement um, uh, solutions at the foreground is because the way that we talk about this problem is all about um, after an offense has happened, hating the person who did it and wanting to punish the person who did it. And, and we don't even think about what happened before that like how we could have prevented this outcome. Um, and so that's why um, so many of the solutions that we get offered are so bad and why the better solutions like the Jenna Quinn Law and Invest in Child Safety Act don't get any traction because people don't think about the problem um, as a preventable one. Um, the, there's a myth, a very prevalent myth, that child sexual abuse is unpreventable and the only thing that we can do is just throw the hammer at people who commit this offence after it's happened. So, yeah, those would be my thoughts. Uh, Aaron, anything to 
Ed? I'm going to add one thing. Um, Jeremy, you showed the slide uh, of the Apple feature that was added a couple releases ago, where, which allows parents to elect for, for children where they're going to send what looks like an, a nude photo or receive uh, to give that prompt for what, what I'll call an exit opportunity. Um, that's, that's a term used often with offenders. Uh, but I, I kind of like the idea of the client side. So happening on the phone outside of the, the monitoring of everybody else. But I think that we can use technology to detect on the client side, something, something like that happening. Um, and that can go with, you know, with words. I, I know if I use uh, Gmail and I send an email that Google thinks there should have been an attachment, uh, it's going to say, hey, did you forget to send an attachment? Um, so we are we're we're there. We're, we're used to surveillance. Not not the Proton Mail users. They're not used to it. But um, you know, in the family law world, a lot of uh, parents that are co-parenting and are divorced, they communicate over apps that use this technology. And if they're texting over the app and saying some real nasty stuff, the app will pop up and say, you know, your heart rate is up. Uh, are you sure you want to send this text? You've used all capital letters. Uh, why don't you wait a couple minutes and then see if you want to send it? So I feel like those kind of local private uh, exit opportunity prompts uh, can be a, an effective way that we can use technology um, without uh, sacrificing privacy to help to curb this issue and cause people to get in that pattern of thinking before they're clicking and, and resisting impulses. Thank you. Resisting impulses, that's a topic that comes up quite a bit in my, in my line of work. Does anyone else have questions or comments that they would like to offer? And thank you, Christine, for your wonderful questions. You actually asked some of the things I had kind of right on the tip of my tongue as well. So thank you for that. It was incredibly informative to hear those responses as well. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop in here just for one one second and ask. Well, I guess my son will ask a question, um, and that is, you know, as as someone who comes at this topic from the other perspective, as Jeremy mentioned, um, I mean, I am the current executive director of Prostasia, but I'm also a research psychologist and um, a scholar in in the field of of sexual abuse prevention, but I come from right, the, the field of psychology and, and conducting research. So what I'd like to know in, in all of this, not being an expert in technology, not being an expert in privacy and all of that is, you know, what we can be doing, right, as, I know child, give me a minute, you know, <laughs> as my child is growing up here, um, you know, what can we as parents be doing to protect our, our children online and you know what you know what are some of the, the the solutions that we can be that we can be using really to protect ourselves um you know to make sure that our kids are safe to make sure that we're safe i know that aaron discussed um several different options so i'd like to hear more about that Um, are you asking for specific uh, technological recommendations as far as, you know, how to actually practically protect your kids online? Yeah, I'm thinking for, for people who don't work in this field, right, who don't really have this kind of expertise, you know, what should we be thinking about as we're, for example, you know, communicating with family and sending pictures online? like over apps when we're sharing family pictures or or anything like that, you know, what should we be thinking about? How can we be ensuring that, you know, we, that we as parents and our kids are also safe? And I will be the first to say that my 18 month old does not have his own phone yet. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one thing that Aaron said earlier, which I uh, think is good advice is um, to make sure rather than, um, making your 
children feel um, that they have to, um, that, that they're being monitored constantly, give them a, a little bit of um, uh, an, enough freedom that they uh, they don't feel that they have to hide anything from you. Rather, they can come to you um, uh, if anything that uh, concerns them comes up. Um, the one of the child protection organizations from Canada says that parents should uh, tell their children that they don't have a right to privacy. I think that's a terrible idea. Of course, your children should have a right to privacy, um, just like you wouldn't necessarily come into a teenager's bedroom without knocking, um, that sort of thing. Um, so yes, they have a, a right to privacy, um, and that includes um, how they use their device, but um, that also comes with responsibility. And um, so making sure that they are communicating with you about their device use, um, that you're, um, uh, you know, just checking in with them as they're using their device and uh, making sure that everything's okay, um, rather than necessarily having parental spyware on there. Um, I think it's much more effective to be uh to be monitoring their use using, you know, your whole, um, not technologically, but just by being there and being around them. I think that's the better way to to monitor um, their device usage. I'll add uh, just one thing, and I know uh, Confidence, one of the participants has a question. Um, yeah, I think, I think being a partner as much as we can to our children, um, I think letting them know, listen, you know, I, re I respect that you want privacy, um, but I also have a responsibility to protect you. That's, that is part of my job. So, you know, we, we have this, this trust kind of give and take, um, you know, for, for us, as our kids were getting younger, we kind of, or as they were getting older, we kind of said like, all right, we're going to monitor, you know, less. Um, but if we detect something, we will get your phone and look at it. And we were almost always right. There was something, some kind of bullying, um, somebody was upset, and then we could address that. And, uh, you know, I think I think we kind of got the respect from the kids. Um, and I think that generally up to a certain age, the kids appreciate that you are there to protect them. They want to feel protected. Um, you know, when it gets into the later teenage years, it gets it gets to be a challenge. You you know, go to therapy, figure out <laughs> what to do. I don't know. And that's what my son thinks about that. Um, yes, confidence. I see that you have your hand raised. Okay, um, good evening, everyone. I'm calling in from Africa. Um, cyber safety. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a cyber safety tech educator, and I am a mother as well. And um, very, and I'm an educator. I run a not-for-profit initiative on cyber safety and digital citizenship. And um, I've been so much interested in all this whole talk about um, encryption and privacy as it concerns children. And I'm asking, most of the things and conversations I see online are more like um, they are not African focused. And I'm wondering, as an educator, I've been into classes where many times I hear my students talk about them being contacted by strangers they don't know and having connections. In fact, there has been situations whereby these girls or young boys go all out to go and meet these strangers and some of them have lost their lives in the process and some escaped being killed or being abused. My question is um, right now, how most, most of this conversation being talked about on privacy and um, protection of children from um, child sexual abuse materials, how are we connecting to Africa as a region, because I believe that this whole issue of um, online harms is not just for one region, it, it affects everybody. It affects practically every child who is digit digitally connected. So I don't know 
what conversations, what organizations are also focusing on children in Africa. Then secondly, I also want to say this coming from a point of view of a parent and also an educator. I think we're in an age where no parent has an excuse not to know anything about new and emerging technology. We need to learn them. We need to understand what our kids are doing online. We need to talk with them, explore their digital world with them, agree with them on what is right and what is not right. No parent has an excuse. We need to be, we need to be open-minded to learn as parents. And talking about um, encryption and whether it should, uh, there should be an encryption or the sh and children should be empowered. I think I would also advise that children who are facing these harms in the decision making should also be invited to the table. We can't talk about them. We can't say we are protecting them when we are not even hearing about their pains. So I'm also advising that while everybody is talking about protecting the children from online harms, we need to hear more of what they go through because I personally, when I'm training on have, or having a section on cyber safety, I see the young people I train coming after my classes to tell me very strange things I never even believed they are going through. So we need to also have them at the table in discussions concerning their protection. So that's my one penny talk and advice here. Thank you. Yes, to everything you said, thank you so much confidence for not only attending this event today, um, from what I can imagine is a later time zone than now, um, but also for raising all the points that you did, because I think that is, yes, just absolutely yes. Um, and we at Prestasia Foundation would absolutely love to hear uh, more from you about that topic. I'm going to mute myself because my child is having issues. I'll let Jeremy take over. Um, actually, I uh, was just uh, going to have to let you know that I'm I'm going to have to drop off to take another call at 10 a.m. But I've really appreciated the opportunity to uh, be here. I hope we can have another um, event like this again uh, very soon, uh, maybe with some new faces. Um, so, and th um, thank you, Confidence, as well, for um, bringing to our attention how there is often a um, a lack of global perspective in these um, discussions that we really need to to work on. Um, so, uh, I, I'd love to be able to stay and talk some more, but I am going to have to drop off. Uh, so, thank you once again for having me, and uh, and feel free the rest of you to to stay around and continue the discussion. So, thanks once again. I wanted to, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I wanted to also thank Confidence for, for her points. Uh, I think they're very important. Um, I completely agree that the kids have always blown my mind. Even being in the field, they see things through a different lens. I believe they're on, they are on the front lines. Um, I've, even some of the cases that I've worked on, uh, especially in the early days of Snapchat, I've, gone to my kids and asked them, hey, can you show me how this feature works? Um, I think installing the apps that the kids are using, uh, whether it's Roblox or Minecraft, you know, being available, letting them play the games in the living room so you can see how they are interacting with other players. Um, and also so you know what parental features uh, and controls are, are in those apps and games. Sometimes they exist and we can, we can implement them, but we just don't know that they're, that they're there. Um, and I do, I think we can use technology. Um, you know, we've always been an iPhone, not always, but uh, we mostly have grown up with the kids with uh, Apple devices and their parental features have been significantly better over the last five years, maybe, maybe longer. Um, where you can restrict, not you're not restricting everything, you're not full monitoring, but you are restricting new apps that are being installed. So if somebody says, oh, I want to install Telegram, then you can have that conversation. You can say, let me check out Telegram. Let me check out this app. 
and then talk about, you know what, this app is not safe, this activity is going on, uh, let's figure out a different way you can communicate safely with your friends. So, uh, you know, I think we, we do have to learn the tools and, and include the kids in the conversation. Uh, I don't know, I, I think that's more of a Gillian's expertise um, to know what other organizations are, are the worldwide ones. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm screaming from the, from, uh, from my state and just from my little corner, but, uh, I, I would like to see more international organizations, uh, reaching all the continents and all the children. I absolutely would too. And, um, on that note, I think it's time now that my kid is literally beating me up, um, I think it's time to call this, um, to bring this to a close. So I thank everyone for taking the time out of their schedule today to attend this event. And I hope that we were able to answer some questions or provide information to help fill some gaps that maybe, um, that maybe you've had. And I think confidence has has just taken first place with uh, addressing some points that I think we're all missing. And that is really making sure that we're including everybody um, in this conversation. So um, we really need to make sure we're protecting the world's children. So on that note, thank you very much for spending an hour of your Friday with us. And this event will be available again online. Uh, so it was recorded today and it will be on Prostasia Foundation's YouTube channel um, for future viewing if you if you would like to take notes again. Um, and yeah, so I wish everybody a wonderful weekend, a wonderful holiday season for those of you that are, those of us that are going into to holidays next week. Um, and otherwise, um, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again and looking forward to the next one. So stay tuned, everyone.